I was a little insulted a while ago. Um, two people told me that I preached long Sunday morning and Sunday night. And uh, they said, one of them said they expected me to make up uh, this evening by letting out early. And um, I didn't promise them anything. And just for comments like that, I might just go over. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't plan to go over. We had a visitor with us um, Sunday night. And uh, she's a friend of, of um, Angie Becker. Thank you, Brother Gould. And uh, she sat back there, and uh, uh, Angie leaned over and, and said, he doesn't usually preach this long. <laughs> I usually preach about 35 minutes, which uh, compared to most Baptist preachers is not, is not long. And uh, Brother Steve Williamson says, I spoil you guys, so that when other preachers come in, if they preach long, they look bad. And so I was like, hey, whatever it takes, if you preach long, you look bad, <laughs> that's on you. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. I so enjoyed preaching through Hebrews chapter 7 on Sunday night. It was a blessing to me, and it's one of those messages that you go home from thinking to yourself, I don't know how anybody got anything from it, but I sure did enjoy the study, working up to it, and then being able to teach it and to preach it. If you've never taught a class, or if you've never preached a sermon, then you may not understand, but... Um, you, you, when, you, when you're teaching or you're preaching, you're, you're getting preached to as well. Uh, when, you're, when you're saying and delivering the thoughts that God gives you, it's as convicting for the preacher, or should be anyway, as it is those hearing. And so that's, that was the case Sunday night. I was reminded of just how great my high priest is. And uh, Jesus Christ truly is better. And I would rather have my high priest, Jesus Christ, as any priest after the order of Aaron. Amen. I'd rather have him. Uh, he, uh, Philippians chapter 4 this evening, I'm going to preach a message on six things, six commands for Christians, six commands for Christians. Many times uh, people will sit in my office and as they're looking for advice or maybe just a little bit of help in some situation or whatever, um, they'll say something, something along the lines of, I just don't know what to do. I wish that, I wish the, the decision was an easy one. I, I don't know which direction to go. Pastor Summers, what would you do if you were me? And, and things like that, I'm, I'm flattered that people think uh, uh, this preacher would have an answer to anything that, that, that flatters me. But the reality is, the Bible has all the answers that the preacher is going to give you. It does. And so, and, and many of you have, have been in my office at, at crossroads of different kinds and, and not knowing which way to go. And, and you know, I'm telling you the truth. I'll just flat out say, well, how are you doing on your devotion? How are you doing on your, on your per personal time with the Savior? Are you reading? Are you studying? Are you living what you're reading? That's a big deal. It's amazing to me how much easier it is to do the will of God when you're in his word and you actually know what the Bible says about the will of God. Why? If you're not being obedient to those major things, those major doctrines of the Bible, if you're not being obedient in those things, why would God reveal his 20-year plan for your life? It just doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. As, as a parent, some of my, my biggest frustration is when my kids anticipate what's coming next before they finish the task at hand. Oh, that aggravates me. We, we, uh, we, you know, with seven kids, and some of you with three or four kids, maybe five or six kids, you've done the very same thing. Traveling is much easier with kids at night. It's much easier. Uh, we, we, we usually leave after church, usually after church Sunday night, but sometimes Sunday morning, and we'll drive as far as we can. As long as I can hold my eyelids open, I'm driving because those kids are sleeping instead of wanting to stop to use the bathroom. And so I'm just going to drive and drive and drive. And um, we leave late at night. So we'll leave church. We'll go home. And Melody will most of the time have everything packed. We just got to get it in the car. Got to get the kids in their pajamas, get them on the road. And it drives me crazy. The kids will be so excited about seeing grandma and grandpa are so excited about just getting on the road they love traveling why they like traveling I don't know I'm the crankiest parent when I'm traveling with my kids every time someone says they have to go to the bathroom I'm just like throw them an empty cup we're not stopping I mean I'm just that kind of parent but the kids love it and we'll be, we'll be saying, oh, you take the suitcases, go put them out in the van. And you take the pillows and blankets, and it never fails. You get out the front door, and there's no kids to be seen, but there's piles of luggage right in the driveway or right on the front steps. They're anticipating what comes next without finishing the task at hand. And Christians are the very same way, very same way. I'm a 33-year-old man. Am I 33 or 34? 
a 30-something-year-old man, and, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm younger than a lot of people in here, so I, I'll just speak as, as a young person. I know from experience being, and, and you maybe remember as well, but I remember being 16 and 17 and 18 years old, and I was ready to, I was ready to get to the next step without first being obedient in those, those vows and oaths and promises I'd made the Lord as a teenager. Okay, Lord, I just, let me just get to what you have for me when he wanted me to obey him. And learn obedience, learn faithfulness, become faithful in the little things, and then he'll reveal the rest to us. And so we come to the fourth chapter of Philippians. And in the first six verses, we're going to see six things, six commands to Christians. Now, if you hold your place there in Philippians chapter 4 and go back to chapter 1, just so we can clear up this, this argument right now about, well, preacher, this isn't really to us. Well, let's just, let's just see who this is to. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. If you're there, would you say amen? amen? Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Everybody say, all the saints. All right, all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. It's amazing to me how selective we've become with what things are for us and which things are not for us in the word of God. Now, this is written to the entire church of Philippi. It's a, it's a church epistle. It's a letter written to the church. That's you and that's me. And so let's just take all that's in the book of Philippians and apply it to our lives tonight. Just purpose right now that you are going to find something in the message tonight that you are not doing or you're not doing properly, and let's improve on it. Wouldn't it be great if we leave this building tonight as a church deciding to do something different for our Savior? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I don't know the people of Philippi. I don't know all the relationship that the Apostle Paul had with them. I'm not sure how big the church was. I'm not sure what the average age of the church was. I don't know what the median income of the people of the church was. But here's what I know from verse 1 of chapter 4. The Apostle Paul dearly loved these people. His heart was knit with them, which is very strange and ironic when you think of what all happened to Paul at Philippi. He was scourged, he was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was drugged before a council. This is in Philippi. And yet he calls them my dearly beloved, my longed for. What a, what a great phrase. But then right in the middle of that verse, we find the first command. The first command. This is what he says to people that he loves so much. He calls them my brethren, dearly beloved, my joy and crown. He says, my dearly beloved, again, at the end of the verse, here's what he says to them. So stand fast. So stand fast. You know, we, we find that word so used in the same context in the same way in another very common verse of the Bible. Can anyone guess what it is? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's the apostle Paul writing to a church that he loves dearly. He loves them with all his heart. And by telling them to stand fast, he is assuring many of them persecution, imprisonment, uh, for many of them, standing fast for the Lord Jesus Christ would ensure that they'd be rejected by their family. And yet he says, my dearly beloved, so stand fast in the Lord. In other words, it just with all that's in you in a very big and powerful and a, and a determined way, stand fast. So the first command for Christians, if you're not doing this, mark it off on your checklist and say, I need to improve on this. Let's stand fast. If ever there's been a time in our country where the people of God need to stand fast, 
It's right now. If ever there's been a time in our country where it's going to cost the people of God something for standing fast, it's right now. If you don't believe it, just ask the bakery, uh, the bakery owners out there who refused to do a wedding that they didn't agree with because of a moral conviction, and now they've lost it all. Ask them if it cost them something. But the command is to stand fast. Just ask the, the county clerk who refused to sign a marriage certificate between two men or two women. Ask her if it's cost her something. And she'll say, yes, it has. But the command is stand fast. We've got to stand fast. The world is pushing us back. It's pushing us and cornering us and backing us into an impossible situation. And they're trying to get us to the point where we make a decision. Either stand fast or give in. And the, the command is to stand fast. Here's the Apostle Paul telling the entire Philippian church, stand fast, my dearly beloved. Secondly, look at verse 2. Verse 2, the second command here. I beseech you, Odious. I like that name. And beseech uh, Syntyche. It'd be awesome if they were brothers. Can you imagine growing up in that family? <laughs> you, Odious and Syntyche, get over here. That they be of the same mind in the Lord. It would be a shame to have a church of, of 250 or 300 people. And everybody's standing fast, but none of them standing together on the same thing. It'd be horrible, wouldn't it? It'd be horrible. I'm just telling you, as a pastor, it'd be horrible to be convicted of things in the word of God and to preach your heart and pour yourself into the message and beg the people to, to join you on this side and have them plant their feet and say, I'll not move. I think I'm doing right just where I am. What a miserable place to be in. The second command is be of the same mind. Stand fast, stand fast in the Lord, but be of the same mind. Hey, the people sitting next to you in the pews, the people sitting on the other side of the church from you, the people in the choir, the people that are teachers, they're on your team. These are your brothers and your sisters. They're on your team. They want to see you succeed. Let's be of the same mind. Look at chapter, chapter 2 of Philippians. Chapter 2. Look, at, begin reading in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love. Hey, that'd be a good start. Be of like mind, having the same love. I was laughing Sunday out in the foyer. I stepped back and I could hear conversations taking place and I literally laughed out loud. There were people talking about the golf season coming to an end. There were people talking about how many times they'd been in the tree stand with a bow this year. Uh, there was people talking about their, their fishing boat and their repairs being done to their fishing boat. There was people talking about going out of town on a sales trip. And there was people discussing um, a, a blown out diaper in the nursery. I'm talking, I'm standing here and I'm just listening to all of these conversations going on around me. That is amazing to me. Think about how, I don't even hate to use the word diverse anymore because of the, the connotation that goes with it, but think about how, how varied we are in personality, in likenesses, hobbies. We're so different. Say, there are several ladies in the church selling hair clips right now. How many of you have seen the new hair clips they're selling? <laughs> this from the baldest man in church. I don't care a thing in the world about hair clips. And yet I can still fellowship. Brother Keter says amen. <laughs> I can fellowship with these ladies that are selling them. It's important to them. Brother Lacey, you had GTO. What year was your GTO? 65. He had a 65 GTO. Beautiful car. Completely, completely redone. Hey, I don't know a 65 GTO from a 1996 GTO. Even a 1996 GTO? I don't know. I have no idea. But me and Brother Lacey Fellowship love each other. We're supposed to stand fast in the faith for the Lord. 
in, in the Lord, and we're supposed to be of the same mind. And then chapter 2 says, of the same love. You can, you can love your car, and I can, I can love going fishing, and you can love your football game, but that's great as long as we're coming together for the same love of Christ, for the same love of the Word of God, for the same love of lost souls being saved. Be of the same mind. I don't want to divide a church. Hey, clicks, clicks are natural. You know what a click is? Now, in some of you guys' mind, you, you, click has been such a negative thing, you think of a click as a group of people that think they're better than everybody else. Tell me this, wouldn't you look at someone really weird if a group of retired, retired men were standing in a group talking about golf, and then a 19-year-old man came up, threw his arm around them and said, hey guys, what's up? You'd say, what in the world? This guy's got some problems. Not that he's being rude, but there's just something that's not natural for a 19-year-old to be buddy-buddy with a 55-year-old or 60-year-old or 70-year-old about golf. Maybe they both like golf, but it's just a little strange. It's totally natural for me to gravitate to those in the church who like the same things that I like. There's nothing wrong about that or harmful about that. Don't say, oh, the church is too cliquish. Well, I'll just be honest with you. I, I'd much rather see a group of teenage guys in the parking lot talking about cars as it would a whole bunch of teenage guys and teenage girls in the parking lot talking about who knows what. I'm just telling you, I'd, I'd rather have that. Clicks aren't always bad, as long as you can still be of the same mind with everybody else. The church has a single focus. The church, the design of the church by God, who is the head, is for the church to move forward for the cause of Christ. Let's, let's stand fast for truth, stand fast in the Lord, but be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. Uh, chapter 2 goes on to say, have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3 says the very same thing. Be of one mind, let your thoughts, let your focus be the same. Uh, the church will disintegrate and fall apart if we don't have the same mind, the same love. It's very, very important. Go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, look at verse 3. And I entreat thee also... True yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. A couple of, a couple of words in that verse that we need to, to look at, that, that word yoke fellow. That's a funny word. It's a funny word. Fellow means to be teammate, uh, co-worker. We fellowship, don't we? We fellowship with one another. That is two fellows coming together to experience their fellowship, to discuss that which brings them together. The apostle Paul, who was possibly the greatest preacher in the New Testament aside from Jesus Christ, some would say Peter may have been, who, who knows, doesn't matter, one of the greatest preachers writes to the entire Philippian church and addresses them all as the, his true yoke fellow. In other words, he is my fellow. He is my friend who has willingly picked up the same yoke I'm carrying, placed it on his neck, and we are working together. He addresses the whole church as yoke fellows. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? The third command is very simple. Help one another. Help one another. It's not my ministry. Uh, the, the choir is not Brother Larry's ministry. Uh, it, it's not the way things work. We are yoke fellows. And if I as the pastor don't work with Brother Larry, the choir director, you're going to see animosity and friction and enmity on the platform and the service will be cold and, and emotionless. There'll be no power of the Holy Spirit. But when we come together as true yoke fellows, both with the same yoke on our back, the yoke of Jesus Christ, he says it's easy, his burden's light. When we come together and we work and we pull and we labor side by side, so much more gets done. So much more gets done. My sister and I were talking recently and, and kind of reminiscing about growing up and, and some of the churches we were in. You've heard me tell my testimony before, but my dad was a pastor of smaller churches. And, and um, I'm, I'm telling you, on, on Sunday morning, 
You try to stay encouraged, but on Sunday morning you walk in and you're looking at 35 people, and that includes your own family. It's hard to stay encouraged. There's not many yoke fellows in a church like that. When something needs to be done, it's the pastor and his children doing the work. Thank God for a church full of workers who in the middle of the day on a Wednesday afternoon, there was plenty of staff in the kitchen, plenty of people serving food, cleaning up, setting up tables. Thank the Lord for yoke fellows. Thank the Lord for people who say, preacher, if you're going to the ball game to hand out tracks, I'm going with you. Thank God for yoke fellows who say, I'll do whatever needs to be done because you are my fellow. I'm your fellow. We're fellowshipping with the same yoke. Move forward together. Help one another. Paul says, stand fast. Stand fast. Don't let them move you. Don't budge. Stand fast. Be of the same mind. Be be, be just one mind in everybody. And then help one another. Paul says, there's certain women in that church that were such a help to me. Would you, would you look in on them, their fellow laborers? Would you, would you help them? Would you help lift their burdens? He says there's, there's certain men in your, in your midst, in your presence, who have worked tirelessly to see the propagation of the gospel go forward. You make sure you look after them. Don't let them get fatigued. Don't let them get worn out. <laughs> let me tell you what happened to me a while ago. I guess it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Moms get one day a year. Dads get one day a year. Pastors get a whole month, apparently. I, have, I am wore out this afternoon. I, I, I got about two hours of sleep last night, and I hit the ground running this morning with the funeral. I am just worn out. I was sitting in my office a while ago, and I said, Lord, I need, I need a recharge. I just need a, a boost. And I thought about going to get a cup of coffee, and um, my wife was, I, was in my office, and she was asking what this was and that was, and, and I said, I don't even know what the brown, brown bag is in my office. I don't know how it got in there. And she said, Miss Teresa had just set it in there. I didn't see her do it, but uh, she brought it over and put it on my desk. Now, now, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not a health drink person, okay? I'm, I'm just not. Health drink, hey, tea is a natural, natural thing, so I love sweet tea, man. Fill it with sugar. I want it so thick, it's like syrup on pancakes. That's, that's, good. that's a health drink to me. Thank you. See, hey, there we go. True yoke fellows right there. One mind, solidarity right there. So Miss Teresa and Miss Ellen have got this stuff called super mix. I read the, I read the, 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 uh, the directions on these little packets, one packet a day. They're, they're, they're convinced they're going to keep me healthy. You're supposed to mix this with, with 16 ounces of water, and you're going to create a delicious, fruity slurry, I think is how it, how it words it. I have tried mixing it with water. I have tried, this is going to laugh, I've tried mixing it with Dr. Pepper. I have tried mixing it with jello, or uh, yogurt rather. I have tried just opening the powder and dumping it and just chugging it as fast. The stuff is horrible. It is, it is nasty. I can't stand it. And I have no idea where I was going with this. I've just completely lost my train of thought. I got so sidetracked on this nasty health drink. Uh, oh, I know where I was going with it. So Melody brings that bag and sets it over my desk. And I just told Miss Teresa last night or on Sunday, whenever it was, I said, Miss Teresa, I love you. And I'm thankful that you spent that money to get me that stuff. But I've got to tell you, I have got to quit taking it. It is making me sick. <laughs> I can't take it. She goes, well, just stop taking it. Well, then she brings this bag in. And there's three green boxes in this, this bag. And Melody said, I think it's more of your, of your uh, health drink. And I went, oh, no, no. And she brings it over and it wasn't. It was three boxes of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies. I said, thank you, Lord. I ripped those bad boys open, and I had five or six Thin Mint cookies. And I said, I'll drink an extra pack of Supermix tomorrow to make up for it, I guess. But <laughs> it's good to be helped is what I was trying to get at. It's good to be loved. It's good to be, hey, it, 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 it's good. I, I, hope, I hope you know how good it is to be refreshed and loved by your brothers and sisters. There's certain people you need to, 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 to walk up next to and just help. The command is to help those around you. I wish we could get a hold of that. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
You know the curious thing about that verse? Go, go, go to Galatians with me very quickly. Galatians chapter 6. The placement of that verse in Scripture is so ignored completely. I want you to notice the placement of that verse in Scripture. Chapter 6, verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That would be a great place to... A good place for that verse would be right in the chapter in Corinthians about charity, wouldn't it? One of the, one of the characteristics of charity would be to bear one another's burdens. But I want you to look at the location of that verse, verse 1. Look what it says. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. It's not about charity. It's about a brother in Christ who has been, who has been caught in a fault. Sin has been too, uh, the temptation has been too strong. He's been overtaken in this thing. The, the next verse doesn't say uh, humiliating before everybody. The next verse says, bear ye one another's burdens. When you see that man, don't ridicule him. Don't run him down. Don't run him out. Pick up the burden and carry it for him. Pick up and say, brother, I know it's heavy. I know you can't get over this right now. Let me pray with you. Let me call you tomorrow. I'll, I'll, you'll be accountable to me. I'll, I'll help you the best I can. Bear the burden instead of flaunting the burden. How about that? Look at the next verse. For if a man think, he, think himself to be something, uh, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall uh, he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Right in the middle of all those verses, he says the way you deal with these problems is to bear one another's burdens. Just help one another. That's a good thought. Go to Philippians chapter 4 quickly. I like this one. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse, uh, verse 4. Fourth commandment, very simple. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. I'm looking for someone who is animated that I can count on to be animated. Brother Scott, no, Brother Bobby, come up here. Come up here, Brother Bobby. Now, Bobby, we all know that you are not afraid to make a fool of yourself. We all know that, right? You can lay your Bible down in the front pew. I want you to pretend that you are the poorest man in the world, all right? The poorest man in the world. You have nothing to your name. Are you making fun of me? No, I, I'm just saying pretend, <laughs> pretend. All right, well, the, the clothes you're wearing are all the clothes you have. You have nowhere to, to live. You have no food. You have nothing. And let's say that right here is a sidewalk that you're walking down, all right? And right here on this sidewalk is a pile of gold bars that say free, all right? The big sign that says free. You're walking down the sidewalk. Show us the expression. Show us how you're going to behave when you see that pile of gold bars. This will be great, guys. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's great. Oh, you can have a seat. That was disappointing. That's anticlimactic, I'd say, but how about a little shout and show us with your voice how excited you are. No skipping, just just shout. You want me to shout now? Yeah. That's what I want you to do. Woohoo! <laughs> His skipping got better when he shouted, and that was that was good. You can have a seat. Rejoicing. Rejoicing is what we're trying to, to see here. We think that rejoicing is the same thing as saying, thank you, Lord. Let me, read you, uh, let me read you a definition of rejoice. Here's what it is. And then this verse in Philippians is the ver reference that was given in the dictionary for the word rejoice. Listen to this. Rejoice. To make joyful, to gladden, to animate with lively, pleasurable sensations, to exhilarate. That's what rejoice means. That's what rejoice means. The Bible says we're supposed to rejoice in the Lord always. That is, rejoicing changes a person's demeanor. It changes a person's behavior. 
He, the word animate is used in the definition. It's, it's supposed to be an exciting thing. So many times, people, I just want to thank the Lord. He cured me from cancer when I was on my deathbed. Amen. Are you kidding? Why don't you rejoice about it? Why don't you say, whoa! Why not? Hey, hey, remember when the, the shepherds, I'm sorry, the wise men had followed that star. They followed the star. Long journey. And, and the Bible makes it sound as though they came from a great distance. They get where they're going. And after all the time, however long it might have been, they get where they're going. They find the babe. They look up and see the star and realize the star was sent by God to show us the child that's going to save us from our sins. The Bible says they departed rejoicing with exceeding great joy. Now, I wonder if they got on their camels and rode through the streets saying, amen, thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you for all that the journey was great. The star was bright. Thank you, Lord. I doubt that very much. Man, I'm guessing if there's ever been a party on Camelback, those guys had it. I'm just guessing. Hey, there's certain things we ought to rejoice about. Go to, go to, uh, go to Psalm 119 with me very quickly. Psalm 119. Brother Houle sat right over here, right where uh, Brother Ellsworth and, and Miss Douglas are sitting. He sat over there on Sunday morning, and, um, or maybe, maybe it was Sunday night, but we were preaching, and Brother Houle gets excited about the Word of God. Amen. He gets excited. I love it when Brother Houle stands up and says, Hallelujah to the Lamb! I love it, man. It makes me want to shout. It gets me excited. You know what he's doing? He's rejoicing. Amen. You know what makes Brother Houle rejoice? The Word of God. Everybody say, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Do it again. <laughs> Hold your hands up and say, hallelujah to the Lamb. <laughs> All right, there you go. Well, who will be proud? Psalm 119, look at this with me very quickly. Psalm 119, verse, uh, let's look at uh, verse 111 first. Psalm 119, verse 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. For they are the rejoicing of my heart. David says the testimonies of God, they are the rejoicing of his heart. I got to believe if King David was sitting right next to Brother Hull, he'd have been standing up with Brother Hull saying, Hallelujah to the Lamb. Because the preaching of the word of God, the statutes, it made David rejoice. It ought to make you rejoice. Look, go look at verse 162. Look what he says here. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. It's kind of like Bobby. Now, I don't know if King David skipped quite like Bobby did, but David says, and when I hear your word, when I read it with my, with my own eyes, and I, I hear it read with my ears, when I, it's as though I'm walking down the path and there's a pile of spoils of war right there. It makes me rejoice. Man, you ought to come to church with a heart that's desiring and burning for the Word of God. And when you hear it preached, man, help the preacher out. Why don't you say, Amen? How about, if you're really brave, Hallelujah to the Lamb. It might be good for you. Amen. Rejoice. Amen. Rejoice. Amen. Nothing wrong with doing a little rejoicing every now and then. Amen. Nothing wrong with it at all. Go back to Philippians very quickly. I've got a, two minutes to finish here. Brother Scott says, keep going. Brother Scott's that guy in church that everyone hates. <laughs> Amen, Brother Hool. I'll say, oh, i got to hurry. My time's almost up. And Brother Hool will say, just preach. And I see everybody go, oh. <laughs> Verse 5, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your moderation be known to all men. That's the sentence. That's the statement. Let your moderation be known to all men. That's the fifth commandment. Very quickly, let me give it to you. Do you know what it is to be moderate? Let me tell you, it's confused with being a fence walker. That is someone who's afraid to offend people on either side of the fence, so I'll just stay up on top of the fence and not make a decision and not stand for anything. That's not what moderation is. Moderation is to be able to stand fast, as we read in verse 1. It is to be able to have the same mind, no compromise. It is to be able to stand fast and be able to do it in a peaceable way with those around you. Not going to look for a fight, but not going to run from a fight either. Not, not trying to offend, but understanding that offense might be necessary. 
not looking for, an, for a way to hurt somebody. That's moderation. I'm going to live a Christian life with moderation, not compromising, but not going out to be a warmonger either. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Lastly, very, very quickly, but be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication. Sixth command is don't worry about it, just pray about it. Don't worry about it, just pray about it. Six very simple things that I promise you, it's the will of God for a Christian to exhibit every one of those things in their life. Every one of those things. How's your prayer life? We all know Proverbs chapter three, five and six. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Rest on, don't worry about it, just pray about it. Trust him with it. That's what God wants Christians to do. It's easy to, to, to read that. It's easy to say it. It's hard to do sometimes. Trust the Lord. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Brother Hool, are you in here? Brother Hool, no, Brother, Brother Doug, come lead us in amazing grace very quickly, if you would, please, sir. The kids are coming up from downstairs, and uh, we'll have our prayer time around the altar in just a minute. We'll see a couple of verses of amazing grace together. I have no idea what page it is, do you? No.